Hello and welcome, this is uh, an A2 AQA physics uh, video. This is on the second um, half of uh, unit 5. Um, just to think of what unit was then. Um, so, really, we've just, uh, in the last video for unit 5, we uh, finished off by looking at radioactivity. And what I'm going to kick up this video by is just giving you a bit of a recap of um, radioactivity. Now the first thing we looked at back in uh, the very first video for radioactivity, we looked at Rutherford's experiment and we just said you find a couple of, uh, well not a couple, quite a lot of uh, alpha particles directly at a gold foil and it had to be thin or the atoms might be deflected more than once and it completely disturbed um, previous known theories of radioactivity which suggested, uh, sorry radioactivity, um, of the nucleus which suggested it was sort of a, a, a positive jelly, the, the whole thing was positive with little dots of negative charges dotted around the atom, okay, and obviously it was found out that, as we know today, it was a very small positive centre, okay, which meant some of them were more deflected more than 90 degrees, that's 1 in 10,000 or 1 in 1,000 or whatever it was, and we came up with the equation which was uh, d squared, which is the distance, which is the um, diameter of the uh, alpha particle is equal to the um, diameter squared, so the diameter of the alpha particle squared is equal to the big D squared over uh, 10,000 N, okay, or, or 1,000, sorry, or, well, brain's in a bit of a mess at the moment, um, okay, and then obviously we went on to look at something called the Geiger tube, which, just to give you a bit of a recap, is really just a, it's a, a negative casing with a positive anode surrounded by low um, pressure argon gas, okay, which is um, affected, ionised essentially by the incoming radiation, which means more ions in the in the circuit, okay. Which, as we know, activity is proportional to current, so obviously that uh, is used by the um, Geiger tube and works out the obviously the sees the changing current and uses that to work out the radioactivity. Now, I said you didn't need to know that. Uh, we also looked at which is more ionising, which passes through what, and the essential one thing is that a a um, alpha was the most ionising, so it passed through the least substances, and really passed through a, a little bit of air, okay, so just a quick recap. Uh, and then we went on, obviously, to look at the exponential uh, decay, okay, and I related it to um, charge capacitors, okay, in, in that kind of same exponential graph, uh, and used our knowledge of the equations for exponentials and kind of give a bit of an overview on that. And then finally we went um, to look at dating, so carbon dating, uh, which is just looking at comparing the activity of something alive to something that's dead and working out how long it's been dead for. Um, okay, and then we also, after that we went on to look at traces, okay, so looked at physical and, and biological traces, and then we finished off um, by looking at nuclear radius and density, okay, so sorry for wasted too much, but that's just a quick introduction, well, three minute introduction, it's not that quick, is it, um, to uh, what we looked at last last time. Now what we're going to look at this time is, we're going to start off by looking at the second half, as I said, of Unit 5, and this is all about um, nuclear, sorry, thermal physics, yeah? give it its proper name, yeah, thermal physics, which is not, um, the reason I'm not 100% sure on that is just because it, it, it's, I'm not in this video going to be going on and talking about um, Boyle's Law, Charles Law, uh, and the Ideal Gas Law, okay, because that's what I said, that's all for the later videos in Unit 5, okay. Um, in this video, I'm going to be looking at what we call, uh, obviously, I'm going to be looking at Einstein's Theory of Special Relativity, but I'm not going to be looking at the background, simply put E equals MC squared, but we're going to be looking at that in a slightly bit more detail. Alright, so then after we've done that, we're going to be looking at bind, well, that's kind of in tune with bind, something called binding energy, uh, a mass defect, which is something we'll go on to, and in that I'll recap a little bit of um, atomic mass, okay, that we did in uh, the nuclear side, so please do check that out if you don't know what I mean by atomic mass, okay, remember the, the mass unit, AU, okay, we'll just kind of just say it there. Uh, okay, and then when we've looked at them, we're going to move on and have a quick look at... Um, fission and fusion and uh, we're going to be showing you a graph of binding energy for fission and fusion and then we have a quick recap on nuclear reactors uh, what what one looks like inside okay and then um, 
going to be going on to, um, to obviously talking a bit about that, why we have something called a moderator and looking at critical mass um, and why that nece why that's necessary, okay, uh, and control rods. And we're kind of just going to be finishing off with that. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to start off with uh, in this video is looking at what binding energy is. Well, now what I'm going to draw is kind of a crude diagram of, uh, of some kind of nucleus, okay. So in some kind of nucleus, we've obviously got the centre, a few neutrons and protons, okay, at the centre. And then, obviously, this is a very crude, electrons. Okay, so we've got something like that. And basically, what, what this binding energy is concerned about is breaking up the nucleus, okay? So we obviously kind of ignore all of this. I know I've drawn it out, really. Um, just to kind of... So that is a nucleus. Okay, so um, if we split these atoms up, obviously, well, quite clearly, we're going to have to put some kind of energy to split them up because they are attracted by the strong nuclear force. So we're going to have to overcome the strong nuclear force, be able to break them up. And when we break them up, we're going to find out something kind of strange. So the binding energy is the energy uh, that you need to split up the protons and neutrons from the atom. Okay, so that's what the binding energy is. This mass defect thing, okay, well, when we look at the, uh, there's a mass of the um, atom, okay, sorry, mass of the nucleus, oh, sorry, atom, just apologise, uh, we're going to find that it's not equal to the mass of the, the sum of the mass, sorry mass of the products, okay, and so in essence what it's made up of. And why is that? Okay, well we have to relate it to this um, E equals MC, sorry, delta E is equal to delta MV, MC squared, okay, or energy is equal to changing mass uh, squared, okay, times uh, C squared, so it should be the squared. And that's because we have to put energy in to break this up, okay? And basically, we lose that bit of energy. It's kind of converted to, to mass, really. And we lose, we lose some of this um, energy, and it goes towards the mass of the products, okay? So the mass of the products is actually greater than the mass of the nucleus, because we've put energy in, kind of heated these up, if you can think of it like that, and given them energy, which has increased their mass, as this equation states that energy and mass are related. If you increase energy, you increase mass, because obviously we know the speed of light is constant. Okay, so the mass of the products are larger than the mass of the atom, okay? And you could do any um, equation, okay, uh, and work that one out. Okay, um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to look at, obviously, this, the difference in these two, by the way, there's some of the mass of the products and the mass of the atom. Because the matter, mass of the atom is so significant, insignificant anyway, so is the mass of the product. Now, we're talking about one atom of, of carbon or, or one atom of helium. So they're very, very small, okay? It's not, there's many atoms. It's a singular atom we're looking at here. So as the singular atom has a very, very small mass, almost insignificant, really, so is the mass of the products they're going to have, but so therefore the difference between these two must be very small indeed. Okay, so that's the mass defect really, um, and a bit of an introduction into binding energy. Okay, so that's obviously an equation you would use for binding energy, but obviously you can use it for other things as well. Okay, so what I'm going to, um, is there anything else I missed? Just have a look, see if there's any uh, questions in this that we could do. So let me just... Um... Now, obviously, you might be asked the binding energy per nucleon, which is quite clearly just the binding energy, which you use this equation, okay? And you divide it by the number of nuclei, okay? So that's obviously per nucleon. However, because, uh, one more thing actually, before I go on to um, start looking at fission and fusion, right? Um, binding energy, well, it's the energy to break an atom, uh, the nucleons up from an atom. And 
quite clearly, if an atom, uh, we're going to look at stability and unstability now. If, if an atom is more stable, okay, it's held tighter together, you can kind of think of it like that. And if it's held tighter together, it's going to require more energy to break up. And if it requires more energy to break up, we can imply that it's uh, of a greater um, stability, okay? So you can relate them two things together if uh, you were asked. Now, we're going to relate all of this to fission and fusion. But the first thing I want to do is obviously give a quick recap on what fission and fusion is. Um, now, as I said, you probably looked at this at GCSE, but I want to give you a bit of a recap into hopefully what you remember from GCSE before we move on to the A2 stuff. Okay, uh, well, the words fission and fusion, I like to think of them as kind of saying what they are. Fusion, when you think of fuse, apart from in your plug sockets and stuff, you fuse something together, okay? You, you're combining two things and putting them as one, okay? And when we look at the reaction of a fusion reactor, okay, it's basically collided two smaller nuclei to create one bigger nuclei, okay? So that's fusion. And if that's combining them together, then fission, well, there's logical... Um, removal, okay, they can't be the same thing, so therefore fission must be splitting up the atom. Now, fission is all about bombarding um, stable or generally unstable nuclei, excuse me, with uh, neutrons, okay, and obviously that means that atom, or whatever it was, it's generally uranium, um, and uranium is um, generally 2, 3, 2, 3, 5, but they need 2, 3, 8, so right wing round. So one sec, let me just um just double check my knowledge there, because I don't trust myself obviously. Uh sorry. Great. I just want to get this right before I hope because there's uranium-235 and uranium-238 and um, one of them is uh, a naturally occurring version of uh, uranium and one of them is the uh, isotope of it which is obviously radioactive and unstable. I'm just trying to figure out, uh, sorry, obviously just um, double check which one it is and I'm fairly sure 238 is the um, unstable version of it but just need to double check before I go and tell you that it is and then find out after the video. Ah oh, no it's not actually. Hmm. Great, it doesn't really say. But well, sorry about that, that's not the smoothest of explanations, but whatever. Alright, okay, so apart from my colossal mistake here, what are we talking about? Um Okay, yes, yeah, so, as I said, bind, the higher the binding energy of an atom, the uh, more stable it is. Now, I'm going to go, I think, actually, I already said that, yeah, we're going to move on to fission and fusion. Now, I've already mentioned what fission and fusion are. do apologise, sorry, my brain just lost, and I thought I was still on binding energy. Right, okay, so, the graph I'm going to show you, well, hopefully I, I don't need to draw on the board what we actually, in terms of the diagrams of fission and fusion, in terms of the, the actual, you know, that, um, diagrams of them, but as I said, hopefully you remember that. If you want me to draw one of them diagrams on, uh, as I say, please do let me know and I will um, get on with that. But I just want to do a quick sketch of, um, we're going to be, obviously this is now something you wouldn't have done at um, GCSE. We're going to, I'm going to draw a quick graph, okay? Uh, so if you want to draw yourself a pair of axes, okay, on the bottom we're going to have nucleon number. Okay, and on the uh, y-axis we're going to have binding energy uh, per nucleon. Remember, binding energy is the energy split up uh, the atom into its protons and neutrons. And it looks something like this. Okay, so draw it up quite steeply to a maximum and then sort of a, a constant fall. 
And if we pick this point as a maximum, okay, we look at what that atom is, okay, the highest, the atom, the highest bang energy, um, and that's iron, Fe, with um, an atomic number of 56, okay, so that's Fe, and it's got an atomic number of 56, and what I want you to do, and I'll, I'll explain why, is on the left hand side of this, draw an arrow pointing to Fe56, or moving up towards Fe56, and we're going to call that um, the fusion. And the other and the other arrow, okay, so going down from the ma the maximum to Fe56, we're going to call that fission. Okay, so we just put 56 there, zero there. And um, why does this occur when surely we associate, sorry, this fission and fusion is the energy released by both, it should be energy uh, released by fission. And this is the energy released by fusion. And how is this when obviously we've got a max here, max nuclear number, whatever that is for this test, uh, and a minimum number over on the left hand side. And fusion we know is combining two atoms, two nuclei to make one. Whereas fission is sort of the opposite. It's actually de increasing the number. Whereas we've got an arrow pointing um, towards Fe 56. Uh, and we say that is the fission. Okay. So how does that how does that even work? Because um, as I said, I've just so, kind of explained what fission and fusion are. Great, this book's terrible, I have to say. Right, just to make sure I'm getting it right. Yep, um, that's definitely the right number. And obviously, along this line, sorry, you have um, the individual nuclei. This is kind of the line of best fit. So how does this even work? Well, basically, you can think of them as going, sort of, just following the arrows. Now, this isn't saying, okay, well, up to Fe56, we experience fusion. And but on the right of Fe56, um, we experience fission. No, it's just saying for each nuclear number, what would happen if we use fission or fusion, okay? Um, yeah, that's right. Okay, so, fission. And now fission, they both increase um, the binding energy of the nucleons, okay? Um, so, remember, fission is the uh, splitting up of an atom, but it's split up into more stable, okay? Um, so they have a higher binding energy, okay? So, um, they may, what, what happens, sorry, in, in fission, even though, um, so this is the nuclear number of, atom, of the atom, this is not the number of atoms. That's, that, yeah, that's the better explanation. Okay, so when we, when something undergoes fission, okay, it splits up into two smaller atoms and obviously a couple of uh, neutrons as well. And um, when it splits up, okay, what we experience is obviously it's more stable, so high binding energy, but the nuclear number of that atom is less, okay? So we actually, we have to, we reduce, end up reducing the uh, binding energy, we, we end up increasing the binding energy of the nucleon even though we've reduced the amount of nucleons there are, okay? Well, not reduced, that's the wrong word. Basically, each atom is, a uh, nucleon is, the atom even has got higher binding energy per nucleon. But then we look at uh, the fusion. Now, fusion, we know, is combining two smaller atoms into a bigger atom, which means the nucleon number should increase, okay? And when the nucleon number increases, the atom isn't any more stable, well, it is more stable, yeah, it is more stable, because basically we've got more particles to push apart, and if we've got more particles to push apart, then logically the thing to assume is that you have to put more energy to separate um, the particles, because each of them bring their own force, if you can think of it like that. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the diagram that you need to be able to understand. Okay, so that's really all there is to fission and fusion. Now, obviously, you can go uh, and just look on the, um, who's kind of hoping you understand it, but if you do want to have a look, there are obviously uh, videos, uh, sorry, there are um, pictures on images, Google images, for uh, fission and fusion chain reactions, okay? 
but hopefully you understand what I mean by chain reaction, which is just um, it generally occurs in fission, okay, where you, it splits up into two smaller, sta more stable nuclei, and they produce neutrons as well, which collide with other unstable nuclei, which therefore just continue the process and continue the process. But we're going to look at these two in terms of, obviously, they're used in nuclear reactors. Okay, and fusion is used in the sun, and obviously fission is more used in nuclear power stations. And what I want to do is kind of draw um, the... Okay, let's get the book with the right diagram in it. What I'm going to draw now is the uh, reactor, okay, the nuclear reactor power station that you might see. Obviously, you, you won't see, but you would do if you had a look at it even. And great, the page has just gone back to where I didn't want it to go. Da -da -da -da. Sorry, I do apologise. I if, oh, I keep skipping past. Can't find it. Okay, so in a nuclear power station, you have something like this. Right, so it might take me a few seconds to draw. For which I do apologise. Yeah, actually, I'm going to pause the video now. Right, right, I'm just going to have a quick draw of that. So, I've kind of had a quick sketch of um, a reactor on the board here. Um, okay, so what we've got here is obviously a concrete shield. Um, I've got water, uh, water coming in from the turbines. Obviously, that's been condensed. And steam to the turbines, which actually probably should be the arrow should be the other way around on that. Okay, so the water gets heated up. Gets, it's obviously... Um, it's heated up here through the uh, reactor because obviously the water gets pumped through this pipe, okay, and obviously the heat comes through the steam and heats the water up and then we get it going out to the turbines which obviously turns them, okay, and obviously generates electricity. But hopefully you understand all that bit, so that was really kind of covered in the GCSE. This is the bit we're kind of looking at now. Okay, so you've got your control rods, your fuel rods and your reactor core okay now obviously your fuel rods are um your standard uranium 235 or 238 whichever one uh, that the given yeah, given companies picked all right because uh, obviously the isotope is more expensive because it's easier to react and these control rods now we're going to look at something called uh well actually you may be thinking ah oh, well why do we have someone employed to control the level of these control rods because surely once you set them at a certain rate the uh, nuclear reactions are going to be going off so if you put them down at a certain rate it'll be stopping x amount of um, chain reactions happening so the ca you can just alter it and it will directly alter the temperature so there's no need to move it at all well that's completely indecisive because we're assuming that every single neutron will react with every single um, atom and it will always uh, it won't ever be absorbed into anything else and it will just keep bouncing back and causing these chain reactions. Which is obviously quite clearly not the case. Some of the neutrons are um, bounced into and absorbed by the actual casing. Some are absorbed by the control rods and obviously not, not given out. But the control rods are covered with something we need to know about and that is called a moderator. Now a moderator tries not to absorb these uh, neutrons. What it does, because when, when we have this nuclear fission going, we actually cause the neutrons to move at a faster speed. And if the neutrons are moving at a faster speed, uh, then they are, it's hard for them to hit directly into these uranium atoms or whatever it's produced to give uh, the chain reaction, to start the chain reaction. Okay, so basically what these moderators do is slow the neutrons down to a speed which allows them to react with other, um, with uranium nuclei, okay, and cause this chain reaction. And because some of them are absorbed and some of them um, miss, okay, these control rods, the height of them needs to be altered. Um, because obviously they react very really quickly. Okay, um, so that's why we have the control rods. So, so going on to speak about next. So that's moderation. Okay, um, a thermal neutron is um, uh, something else we need to know about in this context as well. Now, a thermal neutron is, is nothing um, too difficult. It is um, when you type it in on, on uh, Google or like I did on Yahoo. Um, because you know, I can't do them kind of things. 
what essentially a thermal neutron was is um, it said it, it was a, an, an atom which is in thermal equilibrium, which is something where heat is not taken out or put in. However, obviously that's not the proper definition. The proper definition is just basically a thermal neutron is a slow moving neutron. And it, it is right online, it's, it's not incorrect, but if it's moving slowly, it's not passing out any heat, it's not taking in any heat in terms of energy changes, okay, so it's a constant low energy. So they do mean the same thing, but I think understanding the thermal neutron is just a slow moving neutron. It's a lot easier than trying to comprehend what was going on in the definition. Next thing I'm going to talk about is enrichment. Now, these control rods here, they are um, obviously made of boron. But if... Um, Basic, oh actually no, it's not on the control, sorry. Uh, this is uranium, okay. Yeah, 235, sorry. 235 is the isotope. Uh, 238 is the normal uranium, sorry. That's correct. Okay, so when, um, basically enrichment is about introducing more uranium-235, approximately 2.5% of it, into uh, the reactor core, which is obviously where the control rods and the fuel rods are. Okay, and if we do that, obviously we, we cause more chain reactions within the reactor core because there's more atoms, new, uh, uranium atoms to be reacted. Okay, um, now that is a very small percentage compared to the other use for uranium, which is obviously uh, atomic bombs, etc. like that. Uh, and the percentage of uranium-235 in them is approximately 97%. So you can see how powerful they quite clearly are. Okay, um... Now, crit there's something else called critical mass, um, and it's kind of a, as it's, it's the explanation that you would expect to go with this. Critical mass, in its it sounds, is it's the minimum required for something. Okay, it's the smallest that it can be. Well, almost. That's kind of the definition. The proper definition for critical mass is as the minimum energy needed to start a chain reaction, or in other words, it's the minimum mass needed to start a chain reaction. Because we know mass and energy are linked, so you can kind of say that. Um, okay, so it's the minimum uranium needed to uh, start a reaction. Okay, um, and obviously, you know, they um, do need uh, the the coolant which flows through these pipes. Okay, and in, is in the reactor core as well. And uh, what happens is obviously the water slows down the neutrons as well as the. Uh, coating on the control rods of the moderator, uh, but it also cools it down because obviously we get very hot temperatures causing these reactions to release uh, energy, which is obviously increasing the temperature because, um, well, increasing energy is in increasing the temperature. All right, so essentially that's what happens in this example. All right, um, so I do apologize about having to be over on the side of the screen, but um, as I said, just wanted to make sure I was getting a few things right and um, as I said there's no point in me being stood up there at the front when there's nothing more that um, I could be going on about and to be honest the less you see my face the probably more happy you are uh, anyway so that's pretty much a cover of um, thermal physics so that's the end really of A2 um, come back actually uh, that's the end really of A2 physics um, well not the end as I said never ends and it never will end obviously but um, for the actual core knowledge, this is the last video. Um, obviously, it's not the last video of Unit 5. If you were following Unit 5 through, you would now be going on to look at thermal physics, which is obviously all about Boyle's Law, Charles's Law, and I'm obviously going to let myself explain that in another video, okay? Uh, which is, is just about combining equations, uh, looking at latent heat of fusion, which just to give you a bit of an insight if you don't know of it already, it's just the energy um, needed to completely say if uh, you had uh, water that was uh, steaming, okay, to get rid of all them water molecules, that is called latent heat of fusion, okay, it's the minimum heat energy required to completely change uh, a state, okay, or change, that's the energy to change a state. But as I said, I'll let myself explain that. Um, and that's all about Q equals MCL uh, and Q equals MCT. Q, sorry, Q equals ML and Q equals MC delta T. Okay, so thanks for watching. Uh, I do apologize for getting all the equation a bit wrong. But um, I said it's uh, dot the sheet with me. So.
So anyway, thanks for watching. Sorry if I've uh, not been, you know, on the screen as much as you would like and about zooming in just then. But hopefully, as I said, it was quite self-explanatory. Really, a lot of it, as I said, is building on from GCSE knowledge. So I am going to put links in to this video for GCSE. Um, because, as I said, it's just building on GCSE knowledge. Okay, so if you have any other troubles, uh, please do let me know in the comments below. And if you would like... Uh, a complete GCSE recap on radioactivity um, obviously because that's linked into A2 as well it's just without all the tricky stuff uh, obviously I'm more than willing to do that as well but if you have any questions, any queries about anything we've gone through today uh, in this video please do let me know in the comments below and I will try to get back to you uh, as soon as I can thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video